Hi folks, my name is Cole and I have a Master's of Immunology. Today on Investigate, Explore, Discover, we're going to be looking at immune response sex differentiation. So hang around with me throughout this whole video to get the down low on everything you need to know so that way we can dive into some exciting experimental results. Plus, if you look in the description below, there are instructions on how to get a free NFT. Today, we are visiting a topic that has been looked at from many different angles before, which is the battle of the sexes. Now, many people have asked, which sex is tougher, better, faster, stronger? And in just about every physical way, pound for pound, cell for cell, women are the superior sex. They have so much more that they have to go through and they handle it amazingly. What's that? What about the immune system? Yep, even that. There are many studies that describe that women have more robust immune systems. The downside is that makes them more prone to autoimmune disorders like rheumatoid arthritis or multiple sclerosis. Whereas males are more prone to getting non-reproductive cancers like in the lung or kidney and infections from things such as hepatitis B or tuberculosis. Now there are many things that affect how well our body's immune system functions. Things such as your gut microbiome, your sex chromosomes, and the hormones coursing throughout your body. One thing that affects your bodies is your blood, which transports everything around your body. If you do not have enough red blood cells running around, you're going to start running into some problems. You might start to feel weak and fatigued, maybe have some shortness of breath for no reason, and suddenly getting headaches or lightheadedness. Now globally, anemia affects 1.62 billion people, which corresponds to about 25% of the population. The highest prevalence is in preschool aged children and the lowest prevalence is in men. However, the population group with the greatest number of individuals affected is non-pregnant women. Anemia can be caused by many different things, such as having an iron deficiency, excessive bleeding, or becoming pregnant. Now sharing the blood with red blood cells are many other cells that all share a common cell progenitor the hematopoietic stem cell. This cell also differentiates into cells that compose our immune systems. Hematopoietic stem cells can differentiate into T cells like CD4 or CD8 T cells, which are crucial to the function of our adaptive immune system, which helps us to clear infections and mount a pre-prepared defense for the next time that our cells see that illness or disease again. The red blood cell shares a cell progenitor with other cells of the innate immune system, like macrophages and neutrophils, which help to mount a quick, generalized response against illness or injury. Erythropoiesis is the development of red blood cells and is mediated by erythroblastic islands, which are centered around macrophages present at tissue sites. When we are developing as fetuses, we create our blood cells from the liver and spleen. As we reach adulthood, the creation of cells occurs mainly in our bones and bone marrow. However, there are some cases where blood cells start to be created excessively elsewhere. When we are afflicted with infections, inflammations, or hypoxic conditions, we start to create blood cells in our liver and spleen again in a process called extramedullary erythropoiesis, which is regulated by estrogen receptor alpha on hematopoietic stem cells. In normal erythropoiesis, there are many stages that the cells have to pass through before they eject their nucleus and become red blood cells. These stages are demarcated by different receptors that these cells express. Today, we're gonna to focus on CD71 positive erythroid cells, and they express the transferrin receptor CD71 and the red blood cell lineage marker TER119 in mice and CD235A in humans. Now these cells are at a stage in red blood cell development where they still possess their nuclei and have genetic material in them. This cell population comprises of basophilic, polychromatic, and orthochromatic erythroblasts. And during this time, they can also express a marker called CD45, which is known to be a negative regulator of cytokine receptor signaling. It has previously been described that pregnant women and newborns are enriched in CD71 erythroid cells, CECs, in their blood, where they exert immunosuppressive functions. CECs are also found in the gut and the spleen in mouse models, and they affect many different cells throughout our bodies, like CD4 and CD8 T cells, B cells, macrophages, and NK cells in an immunosuppressive manner. They do this through many proposed mechanisms. Some of the mechanisms include direct contact of receptors such as PDL1 or PDL2, VISTA, and galactins. It is also proposed that they can mediate immune suppression through factors that originate inside of the cells, like reactive oxygen species, TGF beta, and arginase 1 or 2. I want to take a moment and really highlight why looking into understudied cell populations in the context of sex is 
particularly important. CECs have been described to be more prevalent in pregnant women and newborns, which are immunocompromised populations that need extra care. And it is also recognized that sex is a notable biological factor that influences how people respond to infections and different treatments. So by learning about this, we will be better able to effectively deliver personalized medicine as it requires knowing more about how cells in our bodies function. If you also think that these are some important reasons to research this topic, go ahead and tap the like button. This brings us to the paper that we're focusing on today called Sex Matters, Physiological Abundance of Immunoregulatory CD71 Positive Erythroid Cells Impair Immunity in Females by Mashuri et al. from the University of Alberta, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. In addition to this just being an interesting paper, it is also a nod to the continuing work of my first lab. Hey guys. So in this paper, the authors investigated the role of sex on CECs by looking at their frequency and immunological function in the context of mice and humans. To start this investigation, the authors asked, what are the levels of CECs in males and females to begin with? So they found that in FALB-C and C57 Black 6, in the spleens, they consistently had more CECs in female mice. They also found increased mature macrophages indicative of erythroblastic islands where extramedullary erythropoiesis occurs. Upon analysis, balb C mice had higher levels of CECs when compared to C57 black 6. To further probe what function CECs have, the authors next looked into what receptors these cells express. They found that CECs had expression of CD45 in both males and females, but females had way higher levels. On the CECs that expressed the inhibitory marker CD45, they also found expression of PDL1 and expression of VISTA. And when looking into other ways that CECs can exert immunosuppressive function, they found the presence of arginase 1 slash 2 and the expression of reactive oxygen species. These results suggest that CECs in adult mice mediate immunosuppression possibly via cell-to-cell -cell interactions and or soluble factors such as ROS and arginase 1 slash 2. Knowing about what receptors the CECs could possibly have, the authors next asked, well, how does this affect T cells, a major mediator of immunity? T cells, when stimulated by antibodies against CD3 and CD28, which serve as activators or agonists, cause T cells to proliferate and secrete activating cytokines like interferon gamma. When CECs are added to T cell culture and the T cells were stimulated, they found that T cell proliferation and cytokine production were suppressed. So to further investigate exactly how CECs were performing this function, the authors inferred, based on previous literature, that CECs might mediate immune suppression via the activity of arginase 1 slash 2, which depletes arginine from the cellular environment and robs cells of the nutrients that they need to grow. So they added excess L-arginine to counteract arginine depletion, and when stimulating these cells again, they found normal levels of stimulation in CD4s and regular levels of proliferation in both CD4 and CD8 T cells. Another important question that the authors considered was how depletion of red blood cells affects CECs. So they depleted red blood cells in the mice with antibodies and found this increased the levels of CECs in the mice a few days post-depletion, which, if you think about it, makes a bunch of sense because CECs are a red blood cell precursor. Now, to put this into the context of infection susceptibility, the authors depleted mice of red blood cells and challenged them with infection of Bordetella pertussis, which causes whooping cough. Mice that were anemic had an increased susceptibility to Bordetella pertussis infections. And interestingly, this result was found in both male and female mice. Now, to see if CECs were specifically causing this activity, the authors isolated CECs from anemic mice and injected them into normal mice. They then challenged the injected mice with Bordetella pertussis, and they found that anemia-induced CECs exert immunosuppressive effects on the host animals during infection. An important part of animal research is its translatability to humans. So to see if these results were similar across species, the authors looked at human levels of CECs in the peripheral blood, because you can't go taking people's spleens. So you need a different organ to look at. They found that there was also more CECs in the female human blood compared to males. And this difference was more pronounced following menstruation. They also found that these cells could express CD45, although they did so at a much lower level compared to mice. Of the CECs that did express CD45, 
the authors found that they also expressed immunosuppressive reactive oxygen species. To see whether human CECs could perform similarly to mice, T cell activity was tested. So the authors found that female CECs could suppress T cell activation and proliferation in a similar way to mice. This activity could also be counteracted by adding excess L-arginine to the cell culture which would hint that human CECs also express arginase 1 slash 2. Now, to quickly summarize everything all together, the authors of this paper found that across species, females had higher levels of CECs in their body, possibly due to increased erythroblastic islands in the spleen, and that these CECs increased in response to anemic conditions. Increased populations of CECs cause susceptibility to bacterial infection, and the mechanism for this lies with what the CECs expressed as they expressed CD45 and other cell contact dependent and independent factors. However, the contactless function of arginase 1 slash 2 by depleting arginine from the environment is what suppresses T cell function. Now, not only do I think that this information is exciting to investigate and learn about, it is also significant in a broader context. This information is significant because it shows that there are higher levels of immunosuppressive cells in women and that these cells are expanded during episodes of anemia and indicate when individuals may be more susceptible to bacterial infections in the respiratory tract. And knowing about this could help to guide treatments and diagnoses of people more effectively. All science is basically a stepping stone for new knowledge. And these steps are driven by questions. And I had a few questions of my own when going through this information. We've learned from this paper that females have more immunosuppressing cells. And from other research, we know that they generally have a stronger immune response, which results in more autoimmune conditions. But how does immune activity and immune cell populations fluctuate over the course of a menstrual cycle? If one of the main differences physiologically between men and women are hormone levels throughout the body, what role do hormones specifically have on CECs? Now, my third question is what role do CECs play in other types of infections? Do they also affect susceptibility to viruses, parasitic infections, or other bacterial infections? My final question, as always, focuses around you. What sort of ideas or questions popped into your head when hearing about this information? I would love to hear about it in the comments section below. Also, let me know if there are any topics that you would like to hear about in the future. Ultimately, I hope that you learned something, but more importantly, I hope that you enjoyed your time doing so. So if you did, give this video a like and subscribe for more in the future. Well, that's everything for today. So thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.